So today I'm going to talk about permutation tests, which is one of my favorite tools. And I, I'll start with just a hypothetical, really, example of a randomized experiment. Um, a set of 24 subjects that were randomly assigned to one of two groups, either a treatment or a control. So purple T's for treated and green C's for control. Um, and, you know, here are the set of responses that we see. You know, the, the, the usual sort of analysis of these kinds of data would be to do, say, a t-test. We um, there's a plot of those data, the, the, the 12 responses for the treatment group and the 12 responses for the control group. The difference between the average for the treatment group and the average for the control is about six with a standard error of about two. So the, the ratio of the mean to the standard error, the T statistic is about 2.8. And if we compare that to the, you know, the T distribution with the, the um, degrees of freedom would be 22 for, you know, 20 sample size is 24 minus two means that we've estimated. We get a p-value of about 0.01. And a confidence interval for the difference between the treatment and control group ranges from one and a half to about 10. Um, so the T test here relies on the assumption that you know the the responses are all independent and that the 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 underlying um, distribution in the treatment group and in the control group each follows a normal distribution. And sort of more direct um, than that um, is to do a permutation test of just sort of more directly ask how um, you know the subjects were randomly assigned a treatment and control group. Um, how how unusual is the the difference that we're seeing here, treatment and control? If we were to randomly, you know, reassign subjects to treatment and control group, how often would we see a difference as big as what we're seeing? Um, you know, so you know we can, you know, keep all the responses the same, but randomly permute um, the the treatment assignments. So take a random 12 responses and call them the treatment group and take a random 12 responses and call the control group. So in this case, the difference between the two, the two averages is about 2.9, we get a T statistic of 1.2. Or here's another, you know, taking the same 24 responses, but randomly permuting, shuffling, randomizing the, the treatment control assignments. Um, here we get a different, the difference in the average is about three, T statistic 1.3, you know, repeat a couple times. Um, so the, um, sort of the permutation test is to, is ra rather than model the underlying population distributions of the treatment and control, you know, hypothetical populations, um, we instead make use of the fact that we've randomly assigned subjects to treatment and control group, and we ask how unusual is the particular pattern of responses with the particular as assignments of treatment and control among all possible kind of reassignments of subjects to the treatment and control group. So if we do a random 10,000 permutations of the 24 subjects, you know, randomly assign 12 of them to the treatment group, 12 of them to the control group, keep the responses exactly the same, but for each possible permutation, calculate the t-statistic, we get this distribution of t-statistics. This is the, um, and so we, we can compare our observed t-statistic, which was like 2.8, to this distribution. What what's rather interesting here is if I if I overlay the t distribution onto these results, the 
it matches quite um, it matches quite well. Now, a lot of the time that this the kind of permutation version of a t t test um, matches really closely to the theoretical t distribution. And so the you know that you know if we were to calculate the p value that corresponds to 2.8 of the area to the right of 2.8 the area to the left of negative 2.8 whether we're using the green curve which is the theoretical t distribution or the histogram which is this empirical permutation distribution you'll you'll get pretty much the same answer and in fact ra fisher in the 30s um, one of his arguments in favor of you of using the t distribution was that it provided this very close approximation to the permutation distribution that he sort of viewed he viewed the permutation test as really the the ideal approach to the analysis of this kind of randomized experiment um, but you know in 1930 doing a permutation test was extremely laborious because you'd have to be rolling dice and then calculating a t statistic all of that by hand be i mean you wouldn't and you wouldn't do a permutation test of 10,000 permutation replicates um, today it's you know it's just as easy to do a permutation test practically as to calculate the 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 you know, to do the t-test sort of using the formal distribution. And um, so I, to me, um, the permutation test is just um, the ideal thing to do in this sort of context. The, you know, the, the key thing is the assumptions for this permutation test are really that are I guess formally that the observations are exchangeable under the null hypothesis. And sort of what this means is that the the labels attached to the observations don't matter. You know, the, the labels subjects one through twenty-four don't matter if the null hypothesis is true. Um, okay, and in, in this kind of randomized experiment, it, Really, the assumption is that you actually have randomized subjects to treatment and control group. That's the only assumption you need to make for this permutation test to be valid. Whereas the, you know, the usual sort of t-test requires not just this independence assumption, but also that the, that, you know, you have underlying normal distributions. So, um, you know when that when those underlying population distributions are approximately normal, the two methods give the the same answer. When they're when the underlying populations are you know close to normal, when the data are close to normal, the the they'll give very similar answers. When there are departures from normality, the permutation test is really the the trusted result and the 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 normal assumption can lead you astray. So basically you should just always do the permutation test when you can, which is what, you know, when it's appropriate. Kind of a related question, you know, in analysis of this kind of um, randomized experiment, I have a treatment in a control group. You know, I'm using the t-statistic, you know, sort of goes with the t-test. I could use any test statistic. No matter what test statistic I use, um, the, the results of my statistical test would be valid, by which I mean that the, the chance of a type 1 error will be maintained at 5% sort of by design. And so what t-statistic? test statistic you use really depends on um, the the nature of the difference you're trying to to demonstrate and I mean, you really just focus on power your power to discriminate between the treatment and control group but it, um, and robustness to outliers for example can 
still is still an important consideration. You know, the permutation test, um, you know, when you have um, skewed a skewed outcome or an outcome that sporadically gives like extremely large or extremely small values. Um, the permutation test has this property that it will ensure that you have um, the type one error rate under control. You know, the chance of giving a false positive is controlled, but it could still have terrible power. So when you have, um, if you're concerned about outlying values, you might still focus on say using ranks and doing a permutation test with ranks rather than using the raw data or you might still want to take say a transformation take logs or square roots to try to um, eliminate this you know skewed distribution or to ensure that the the residual variance in the treatment and control group are still about the same But what I like about permutation tests is, you know, when they're appropriate, you really are only have, you know, this one assumption that of, um, and it, in randomized experiments, which are the things that I prefer to focus on, um, that assumption is, is ensured true by the design of the experiment. You know, particularly if, like me, you're focusing on model organisms where they don't have any choice but to be, to you know, follow the experimental protocol, versus in human studies where even randomized experiments you have the problem of dropout or um, not not following the not taking their their um, their drugs the way that you wanted them to. We, you know, we talked about the permutation test earlier in the course, and I think like very early on, we talked about how many permutations to do. Um, and typically, I do either a thousand or ten thousand permutations, and the reason for that is that I'm focusing on trying to get a good estimate of the p-value for the test. And the the thousand or ten thousand really comes from this if if I look at the number of permutations that are greater than or equal to my observed value, that that thing, that quantity is going to be binomial NP, where P is whatever the true value is. And I'm, if I'm looking for P values that are around, you know, 1% to 5%, then I want, you know, the standard error of my estimate of P to be, you know, a, you know, a tenth as much as its value. And that's where, you know, about a thousand or about ten thousand comes in. With with quite small data sets, you could, in in many in, in some cases, do a complete exhaustive enumeration. You know, in this this um, example I showed, I had twenty four subjects equally balanced, twelve in each group. So the number of possible permutations is twenty four choose twelve, which is a really large number. I'm not going to try to exhaustively enumerate that. But if the sample size were, you know, a third as much, if I had, you know, eight subjects in one or four subjects in each group, um, eight choose four is a more reasonable number. I could just do them all rather than sample at random. Um, so you know, if if the number is is really small, then you start to run into the problem that um, that there just aren't enough permutations for for really any configuration of the data to be um, sufficiently interesting. Um, but if if the num if if the you know total number of possible permutations is on the order of ten thousand, I might just do an exhaustive enumeration of all possible permutations. And that really is just because it is nicer. It sort of, it seems nice to do an exact calculation like that rather than the sampling. But in practice, it doesn't matter that I could just do 10,000, you know, sample completely a random 10,000 times, even though in the 
um, I might have done an exhaustive enumeration. And that's partly just because the code in sampling at random is usually super easy. It's just I call the R function sample or whatever the Python equivalent of that, whereas exhaustive enumeration is, is usually just a bit more um, cumbersome to really sort of loop through all possible exact um, permutations. So, I mean, summary so far, I like permuta the permutation test because in the analysis of randomized experiments, it's sort of a more direct um, question than the usual statistical test. If you just ask, you know, I see these, you know, the, the observed data with the observed allocation of subjects to treatment and control group, how unusual is that among all possible configurations of which of, of the treatment and control assignments. Um, I, th that sort of permutation test requires just this one assumption that in a randomized experiment is, is ensured to be true. Um, it, it's flexible about what kind of test statistic I might use. I don't have to do any real calculations of what is the the null dis what is the distribution of my test statistic under the null hypothesis where there's no effect? I don't need to worry about that. I can use whatever statistic I want. Um, I may still want to take account of outliers when I'm deciding how to how to measure the contrast between treatment and control. Um, pretty much anything I can I can do anything. Um, and typically, I'll do a thousand permutations, and sometimes they'll do ten thousand permutations. It depends partly on how complicated it is to calculate the thing I'm trying to calculate. So, in my own research work of you know trying to find genes for complex diseases, you know, mapping quantitative trait loci, genetic loci that affect some quantitative trait like blood pressure. Um, the application of permutation tests in this context um, was it was sort of introduced in this paper by Gary Churchill and Rebecca Dirge in 1994, and re really was quite enlightening to me. This paper, think back to 1994. Um, the the thing that they were trying to to deal with was really the scan across the genome of the in, in this context of how to account for the multiple testing, permutation tests end up being super useful in this accounting for multiple testing. You know, what, what I've shown so far about permutation tests is that they make it so that you only have this one assumption you have to deal with. But this, the second thing is really a nice way to control for multiple tests. So recall in QTL mapping that kind of the data that I have are um, genotype, a, a rectangle of genotype data for a set of mice as rows and a set of positions across the genome as columns. They come in these blocks where, you know, in a given, on a given chromosome, I'll have a set of highly correlated markers along that chromosome. But from chromosome to chromosome, they're basically independent. Um, and this is an intercross between two lines, and so the, the types of genotypes I have are, say, homozygous red or homozygous blue or heterozygous, here colored green. And then I have a phenotype, um, you know, some quantitative trait on each mouse. Here I've sorted the mouse, sorted the, the 200 mice from lowest phenotype to highest phenotype. Um, because of that sort, you can kind of see in, in the genotype data some relationship between um, the phenotype and the genotype. If you look at chromosome 13, the mice with low phenotype tend to be red, homozygous red. The mice with high phenotype tend to be blue, or homozygous blue. Um, the same sort of thing you see on the X chromosome, that there's more green at the bottom. I mean, sort of more green at the top and more red at the bottom. Um, those seem to be the strongest signals here. 
But again, we, we, the analysis of this kind of data is we'll scan across the genome. At each position in the genome, we do essentially analysis of variants to ask um, how different are the three genotypes. And we, get, we calculate some test statistic. Um, traditionally, in this subject, we calculate this log base 10 likelihood ratio comparing the hypothesis that there is some difference among the three genotypes versus the null hypothesis that there's no difference. And, you know, a long-standing problem how to deal with the fact that we do this scan across the genome where we're not doing just one test, but we're doing a test at every position along each chromosome. And the, the permutation test was really the, the perfect solution to this problem of um, we, you know, if we look back at the, the data, we keep the, this rectangle of genotype data just as it is, but we shuffle the phenotypes relative to the genotype data. We, you know, permute, randomize the phenotypes, sort of break the association between genotype and phenotype. And then with that randomized version of the data, we calculate this same genome scan, get this set of gray curves. So this is, you know, one, one case where with data where I've broken the association between genotype and phenotype, it shows you um, the apparent association between genotype and type across the genome. Or here's a, a second case, a third, a fourth. You know, we repeatedly shuffle the phenotypes relative to the genotypes, do this genome scan, and look at how big of test statistics do we get genome-wide. And we ask, you know, these test statistics that we see with the observed data are really unusual compared to what we might see with um, in, in shuffled versions of the data. You know, in, in looking at the set of blue curves with our observed data, we see test statistics that are really big, like eight or five, and another, you know, test statistics that are, you know, not quite as big, like, you know, sort of two and a half here or two. Um, and the, the question is, well, you know, is it unusual? If, if there were no association at all between genotype and phenotype, might we still occasionally see um, test statistics coming out as big as what we're observing here. And the permutation test directs that straight on of we break the association between genotype and phenotype and calculate the, this genome scan. And we ask, you know, how often in a genome scan where we've broken the association between genotype and phenotype, how often do we see um, these test statistics as big as what we're observing? So for each permutation of the data, we calculate the genome-wide maximum test statistic, and we make a histogram of those. And then we can find, you know, find your test statistic on this graph, say three, and you can find a look at the, the proportion of permutations that hit that or bigger, as a, and that will become your p-value that adjusts for the scan across the genome. So our biggest log score of eight, um, we don't see it at all. We don't see it at all. Anything close to that in a thousand permutations. Um, we can also use these permutation results of, to to give significance thresholds of, you know, you find the 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 ninety fifth percentile of this histogram and use that as a cutoff for five percent significance if you want. Um, so the, the the advantage of the permutation test here is that it takes account of the design of the study, the nature of your phenotype. It takes account of the pattern of missing data that you're seeing here. But really, the the biggest advantage is that it directly addresses this issue of multiple testing. That it shows you exactly what is the um, what is the distribution of the genome-wide maximum? It allows you to, to uh, 
take account of that scan across the genome with um, with no painful theoretical work. And this multiple multiple testing problem comes up all over the place in data science, um, especially in genetics, like you know, gene expression data, proteomic studies, genome-wide association studies, but also in um, epidemiologic studies of all kinds. You're often dealing with you know, hundreds or thousands of predictors that you're trying to associate with an outcome, you end up with, you know, fitting a lot of different models, doing a lot of statistical tests, and um, you want to take account of that in some way at the end. The approach I'm describing here is really the most stringent approach for dealing with those multiple tests of um, controlling for what's called the family-wise error rate. The you know the family here, meaning really the collection of the collection of hypothesis tests I'm considering. So, this most stringent approach is basically saying, you know, imagine that I have this set of 1,500 hypothesis tests I'm conducting. Imagine the the global null hypothesis that none of them, or that sort of all the null hypothesis all the hypotheses are true. There's no effect anywhere. What um, I want to control the the probability that I reject any of them, that I make any false positives at all. A, a common approach to handle that is the bone Ferroni adjustment. Basically, you take your individual p-values and multiply them by the number of tests that you're conducting. The bone Ferroni, that kind of bone Ferroni adjustment is, um, you know, works really well. It, in any context at all, it ensures that you control this family-wise error rate. It doesn't, um, but it can be super conservative because it, it essentially is assuming, you know, they're all independent tests. You know, the, what is the worst possible case and control that control them for that. Whereas here in this um, in, in GWAS or this QTL mapping context, many of the tests are highly correlated and this bone Ferroni adjustment ends up being way too conservative. You could do much better by taking account of the correlation among, you know, genotypes at different positions. Um, it's hard to figure out how to do that theoretically, but the permutation, the permutation results allow you to do it without really any, any thought. You just let um, the permutation results handle the, the, that behavior. We take, for each permutation replicate, we take the maximum test statistic across the genome, we, and we focus on that max test statistic and we compare our observed maximum to that, you know, distribution of the maximum test statistic across these permutations. And that ensures that we've controlled this family-wise error rate. And it does so um, in a way that is sort of right on target. It will give, you know, under the global null that there's nothing going on at all, the the error rate will be exactly 5% rather than a whole lot less than 5%, which is what the bone Ferroni adjustment might give you. And so the taking the maximum test statistic across the genome sort of assumes that the behavior of the statistic in each position is the same. That each of the test, if, you know, if I have a test statistic at, at each position, at position J, I have this test statistic X, J, and I'm taking the max of those across the positions. I'm giving them all kind of equal weight, assuming that they're all behaving the same way. This happens to work in this QTL mapping context. It often is approximately true in GWAS. 
Um, but it does. It, it's not going to be true in all cases where you have multiple tests that you want to adjust. There could be that, you know, say different factors that you're considering. In some cases, you're doing a regression. In other cases, you're doing a t-test, and you're sort of mixing them all together as the set of tests that you're you're dealing with. Um, and so the the simple case that I've shown you here to deal with the multiple testing may not really be appropriate because you have these like taking the max of a bunch of different kinds of test statistics that have different sorts of behaviors. Um, it seems a bit weird. It, it will give greater weight to some tests than to, to other ones. So in that case where the test statistics vary across these tests that you want to you you want to normalize in some way if you know sort of individually you have kind of theoretical null distributions you could turn all those into p values turn them into negative log p values then the, the p values under the null hypothesis will all behave the same way and you can just work with with sort of those p values the way you would work with another test statistic you know, get them all onto the same scale is what I'm saying. But another another approach is to use the permutation results directly to do this. Um, this is sort of a hack, but and I'm not sure whether this matters to you or but maybe just keep this in the back of your mind at some point in the future and say, I want to do this multiple test adjustment in these permutation tests, and I think Carl said some method of how to do it. Maybe I'll email him and and try to get the details down. <laughs> anyway, the the idea, see, so the permutation results. You have some set of tests, the col columns in your permutation results. For each column, you have um, a set of replicates. That's this, you know, each row sort of one permutation replicate. And you're, um, the idea is to, to turn the values in each column into ranks. So I have, say, 1,000 permutation tests results, 1,000 permutation replicates for 100 different test statistics. Each of my, col each of my 100 columns, I'm going to turn them into ranks from 1 to 1,000. And, um, and then so that puts them all onto the same scale of they're all a set of ranks. Find the maximum rank in each row, and that's my new sort of test statistic. I can get, um, look at the, say, the 95th percentile of those maximized ranks, and that will be a, like a, a, a cutoff. Um, I can find where my observed rank stacks in each column and get adjusted p-values out of this. Basically, the, the idea here is to use the, the permutation results to turn, my, the, permuta turn the permutation results into p-values that are sort of empirical p-values. Use those empirical p-values to get you know, the minimum p-value across the 100 tests or whatever that I'm doing. And this allows me to do, um, to control the family-wise error rate in a way that sort of treats each test equally, even if they're, they're measured on different scales. There's been a, a lot of talk in science in the last 10 years about um, abuse of p-values, that um, p-values have gotten a bit of a bad name among scientists. That, and, they, and they are widely abused, that you know, people tend to focus on strict arbitrary thresholds like 0.05. And you know, if you get a p-value of 0.049, they will let you publish in their journal. And if you get a p-value of 0.051, then they'll send you somewhere else. Or people just focus on the p-values and look for small p-values indicating 
that you know the treatment is is important has an important effect rather than actually looking at say a confidence interval for the the true effect a lot of the time people are ignoring multiple comparisons or they're doing a bunch of multiple comparisons and then not telling you about it and so they're focusing on the smallest p values where I, without really addressing the problem of that that's the smallest of you know 300 p values but then you know the biggest problem really is just overall it's you know focusing on hypothesis tests focusing on p values you're turning science into a series of true and false questions um, which just things are more complicated than that than just to say you, know, you can't just reduce um, scientific problems into you know yes or no questions nevertheless I still find p-values useful um, and ba basically in that I find it's often useful to ask could this data set just be a bunch of white noise um, you know is it you know before digging in and really trying to see you know the effects went especially in these cases where you have um, very high dimensional data and doing you know measuring lots of things looking at lots of things I think it's useful to ask the question of you know if there were no effects at all if this were all noise if individuals were just arbitrarily assigned a treatment and control group what would be the chance of seeing data like this you know if the data are equivalent to, to if the data are look to be kind of equivalent to what you might get if there were no effects at all um, it's kind of a sobering statement on and may lead you to question any other conclusions you might come to um, I don't, you never want to stop there but it, I think p-values especially in the context of you know trying to account for multiple testing um, are asking this sort of question you know if there were nothing going on what's the chance of getting data like this I still find that to be a useful question to to ask it's not the only question but it's still a useful one and so even though there's this stigma on p-values and even though p-values can be abused in ways that um, are embarrassing and then might question their value I think they they still um, can serve a useful purpose in um, in some contexts so the, the last point I wanted to make is that you know so this this vanilla case of um, you know subjects in different treatment groups assigned completely at random doesn't really fit most um, situations in reality or it often doesn't fit exactly and that you know this a simple departure from that is this kind of randomized block design where you have blocks say of four experimental units that you think are going to be different either their regions on the field or their you know assays that were up, were analyzed one day and assays that were analyzed another day or you know I mean when you have data in batches and you expect or you are concerned about batch differences um, in that case you know it would be best to do the randomization um, separately within each block so the blocks here I have six blocks that are defined by the, the thicker um, lines six blocks four subjects in each block and I randomize to ensure that within each block I have two subjects that are control and two subjects that are treated you know um, sort of at you know randomly assigned within each block In this case, um, I can't. I can't just do a simple uh, permutation test anymore because the subjects aren't exchangeable. 
I can't really exchange the subjects in this block with the subjects in this block because there are these, you know, batch to batch differences. But what I can do is do a stratified permutation test. I can ask, you know, I, you know, if I calculate a T statistic comparing treatment and control, I could ask, well, how different is this particular T statistic I'm getting with these data to the T statistic I would get if I um, randomly permuted the treat treatment assignment of the four subjects within each of these blocks. So within each block of four, I have two treated, two control. So there will be um, four, um, well, there'll be six ways of assigning subjects within each block to treatment and control. And then in you know, sort of six to the six possible assignments of treatment and control across the whole study. So it's sort of that then um, if I permute it completely at random, because I'll never have, I'll always have in each block exactly two treated, exactly two control. Um, my analysis might actually want to be different here too. Rather than just do a t-test comparing treated and control, I would want to take account of the block effect. Um, you know, say the simplest thing would be to fit a linear model where I have um, a treatment effect, and then I also have, you know, fit a separate effect for each of the six blocks. Um, and then I could look at, say, the F statistic of for the treatment versus control difference. Um, so with these with these data, if I do that, um, the top histogram are the set of stratified permutation results. The bottom histogram are the normal permutation results. It's hard to see any difference here, but you know, in both cases, my observed test statistic is 4.2, and if I just permute everyone at random, um, I get a p-value of 0.04. And if I, but if I restrict myself to these stratified permutations that I only permute the four subjects within each block, I get a p-value of 0.06. Um, so the, the results can be, you know, are, are quite different. It's it's hard to see the permutation differences in this case, but if I if I make a QQ plot, so on the x-axis I have the sorted um, F statistics from the set of 10,000 stratified permutations, and on the y-axis I have the sorted F statistics doing regular permutations. But the the stratified permutations are tending to give larger test statistics than the non-stratified permutations. Um, and so it doesn't matter a whole lot, but it matters enough that, say, the 95th percentile has moved in a little bit from just above 5 to just below 5. Um, these stratified the, it, um, in many cases, you'll have some kind of blocking factor like batches that would prevent you from doing a normal permutation test because the exchangeability assumption that the labels and the subjects don't matter would be violated. But a stratified permutation where you permute the subjects they within each batch or within each block um, w would be the simple way to go. And it, um, and it, it can give different results. And in this sort of case where there are important block differences, it'd be the stratified permutation results that you that you would trust. Sort of in my um, in my research on you know trying to find genes for complex traits, the the main place where this a main place where this shows up is in selective genotyping. That in many it's not as common now as it used to be, but in many cases you would um, phenotype a set of say 250 mice, but then genotype across the genome only the, the, the top mice by phenotype and the bottom mice by phenotype. So 
you know, you phenotype everyone, genotype um, just the top and the bottom 46 or 44 mice. And then after doing an initial analysis, you might go in and fill in genotypes of everybody else. Um, when you have data of this kind, the, the usual permutation test would be, would, um, the assumption would be violated that the, these, the mice are not exchangeable anymore is the mice with the highest and lowest phenotype have much more genotype information than the mice in the middle. Um, and at, at one point, a f um, friend of mine, Abraham Palmer, he asked me about this, like, well, so what do we do in this case where we have this selective genotyping? Um, how do you do, how do we get, um, we can't do the usual permutation test, what should we do? And um, there's not much more to this paper than the abstract, which is, you know, a two sentence abstract that basically says, when you have this kind of selective genotyping, you can't do the usual permutation test, but you could do a stratified permutation test, stratifying by the amount of genotyping that was done. So in a case like this, I would take these middle mice and I would permute them and I would take the high and low mice all together as one batch and I would permute across them. So I would permute between those, would permute mice within each of those two strata defined by um, have a lot of genotype information or have not very much genotype information. And that really solves all the problems related to that and, you know, could just be a two sentence paper but of course, I filled out with a few more pages. Um, but in summary, you know, statistical tests have you know have a lot of limitations. You know, they really are just answering this yes or no question. Um, but they, I still find them to be useful in a lot of cases. And permutation tests, when they're appropriate, are really the most natural kind of statistical test of you just sort of directly asking, what would these data look like if I randomized treatment and control? What would these data look like if I, if I broke the association between the predictors and the outcome and shot the data? Um, and at least for this, um, trying to control this family-wise error rate, of trying to, you know, the most stringent sort of, this most stringent way to control for multiple testing, permutation tests make that really easy by you shuffle all of the predictors versus all of your outcomes, calculate all of your test statistics, maximize across everyone, and um, compare the observed maximum to the maximum you get from various permutations. This stratified permutation test accommodates, a, you know, the common case where you have non-exchangeable outcomes. Um, you know, if you have data that are in these bat in batches or blocks or other things. Um, so keep that in mind. If you have batches, you can't just do a regular permutation test, but you can do permutation, you know, permute everyone within batches, and that solves that problem pretty easily. Um, so, yeah, many people are quite negative about p-values, but I still find them useful. Um, I, I do, it, it is important to always look at um, the estimated effects and confidence intervals for the true effects, you know, get a, a gauge of, you know, the, the, the size of the p-value is not everything, but the size of the p-value can really be, um, I still find it useful. That's all I've got for the day. I'm going to turn off the recording.